So I'm going to start explaining the title of the talk. So I'm going to talk about um, the decay channels for black holes. And by decay channels, I mean something which is pretty similar to what happened to the concept in quantum nuclear theory and in particle physics. So in, in classical general relativity, black holes are stable, which means that if we have a black hole, a black hole is formed in a given moment of time, it will not disappear, but rather it will grow if matter is falling into it. But the situation is different if we go to, if you consider quantum mechanical effects, for instance, if we consider semi classical gravity, because we have the result by Hawking that the black holes evaporate, so that they will decay into a state which is essentially given by flat vacuum space time with some radiation at uh, in the asymptotic regions of space time. So, two observations are important. One of them is that this is a very weak effect, or in other words, the time scale associated with this decay channel is very, very large, it's huge. So, for instance, for a stellar mass black hole, it's going to be larger than more than 50 orders of magnitude larger than the Hubble time. And also, one important comment is that this is obtained in the semi classical approximation, which means that it doesn't take, take into account number two, but if quantum gravity effects. So, this means that there is uh, the possibility, the theoretical possibility, that some effects in quantum gravity permit or allow decay channels that are more efficient, or in other words, have a shorter time scale than this Hawking evaporation. And this is the possibility uh, we are going to explore in this talk. So, in particular, I'm going to consider this possibility, which is the time symmetric decay of a black hole into a white hole. And I don't have enough time to go in detail over the motivation for this proposal, for proposing this decay channel, but it has to, has to do with <coughs> considering that quantum gravity as a fundamental theory has to be time reversal invariant. Okay? But in principle, one can consider any initial and end state, and it's the theory of quantum gravity is quantum gravity which, which is going to determine the probability that the process takes place. So in principle, for any given initial and end state, arbitrary end state, one will get essentially a zero probability, but in some cases, one will get a non-zero probability. So the question is whether one, we can define this probability for this transition. And what I want to explain is that it's possible, making some assumptions and some, let's say, simplest, uh, simple definitions, the simplest definitions one can take. And the result is a very uh, simple result, which is uh, one gets a, an exponential decay law. And the time scale, the mean <coughs> lifetime in this exponential decay, implies that the time scale is going to be much shorter than popular evaporation. So this decay would be much more efficient than popular evaporation. Okay. So let me start uh, considering the effective geometries describing the phenomenon we want to understand. So these are geometries which are time reversal invariant uh, with this axis here, this moment of time being the moment of uh, around which the geometries are going to be time reversal invariant. So the lower part in this diagram is essentially describing the collapse of a star from a given initial radius. <laughs> to form a black hole. So the star has a given finite initial radius, which is this value here. And it's assumed by that by quantum gravity effects, there is a bounce of the star at some point in a given radius. As with analogy, uh, <coughs> making the analogy with what happens in cosmological situations, in some models, quantum gravity models. So then, now in the upper part of the diagram, we have the time reversal uh, version of this of the lower part. So that overall, we have the, the this effective geometry describe the time symmetric bounds of a star, which goes back to its initial radius. So in the lower part, we have a black hole horizon, which is in this radius, and here there is a white hole horizon. The overall 
phenomenon, the overall process, the overall bounds, takes a time, which is given by this quantity here, as measured by observers which are sitting at the initial radius of the star. Well, measuring how long does it take for the star to bounce back. So, yeah. So this, this effective geometry has, uh, it's quite similar to standard tunneling problem in quantum mechanics, because if you, uh, in, in quantum mechanics, we have uh, in this kind of tunneling. In situations in which tunneling appear, we have two classical solutions, I mean, two solutions of the equations of motion. And we have some region in which, uh, which, is not, in which there is no classical solution. Okay? And the two classical solutions are joined by this kind of non-solution. So in this case, we have something pretty similar. We have a solution uh, corresponding to the black hole geometry, a solution, classical solution corresponding to the white hole geometry, and we have, uh, let's say, an interpolating region, which is not a solution of the classical field equation. So the geometry inside is going to be arbitrary, but has to satisfy matching conditions and boundaries, which are these quantities here, the upper boundary and the lower boundary. And this form of the of the, pro, I mean the of the geometries invites to consider a path integral approach. I mean, invites to consider this as a tunneling problem, and consider the Euclidean path integral in order to determine the probability that this process happens, that this kind of tunneling takes place. Okay. The problem is that this this definition of the Euclidean path integral is formal. I mean, in general, it's not well defined. It's, uh, so it's not easy to think uh, how to evaluate this. That what we are going to see is that if we consider a truncation of the degrees of freedom which are involved in the problem, then it's possible to get to give a very precise meaning to this quantity, to some kind of path integral. So in order to do that, uh, we have to start uh, considering the geometries, interpolating the interpolating geometries. I mean, it's like we have to parameterize the geometries in the interpolating region. And this can be done explicitly using find the way groups and coordinates, which are nothing but a specific set of coordinates, in which you can write down the Swarthy solution, even more general solutions. So we have this line element with the, the, te the temporal coordinate, and the radial coordinate. We have a velocity profile which is the velocity profile in the Schwarzschild solution, so there is nothing new here. We have the initial radius of the star, and the important point is that we have a function here which interpolates between the two values corresponding to minus one. I mean, if, if the function is minus one, we have the black hole patch of the Schwarzschild solution. If the function, the fun function is plus one, we get the white hole patch of the Schwarzschild solution. So what we are going to do to consider, I mean, we're going to take functions which interpolate between these two values and the, and the one values. So this function has to be anti-symmetric in order to warranty time reversal invariance. And it depends in, in this variable, which is an trivial combination of time and the radial coordinate. I will explain in the next slide what's the meaning of this quantity here. But for the moment, because of this uh, anti-segmentic property, we, have co uh, we can parameterize, we can characterize every of these geometries in terms of functions which go are defined over the closed interval going from 0 to 1 and satisfying these boundary conditions. So these are the boundary conditions which gives us the black hole geometry of one boundary and the white hole geometry in the other boundary. And we have some conditions over the derivatives of the function, which essentially are demanded in order to one T as both matching okay, at the boundaries. So uh, concerning this function here, it defines, it determines the shape of the interpolating region, which is uh, the non-classical region, because the, the, these boundaries, which in which we are doing the matching with the with the classical geometries, are defined by this equation. So this means that if we change this function, we are changing the shape of this triangle here. And we can make some smooth region, so 
we can make it uh, thinner and go go faster to zero. So we can we can change the shape of the function. So this is the information which is encoded in this function. So you see that this is defined in an interval which goes from the initial radius of the star and the radius which determines the bounds. I mean where the bounds takes place. And this radius can be determined by demanding that the curvature is Planckian in at the moment of the bounds, which gives us, using the Einstein field equations, uh, let's say an order of magnitude of this, of this parameter, which is given by this expression here. So this means that it's going to be much smaller than the initial radius of the star. So in particular, we can consider this small parameter as a parameter in which to make an expansion of the, to simplify, let's say, the problem. And the expressions I'm going to write down later are the expressions at the lowest non-trivial order in this function. Okay. So the shape function, this function uh, controlling the shape of the non-classical region is going to be arbitrary. So it's like we are not going to take any specific function. We are going to leave this uh, unspecified. <coughs> that has to verify some technical condition, which are essentially that it's a concave function and decreases with increasing values of the radial coordinate until it reaches zero at the given value, well, at the initial radius of the star. Okay? Which means that this triangle is going to be closed at this point. So under these conditions, uh, we have this the function is going to have a maximum, which is even the, which is going to be the value of the function at the, in the radius of the bounds. And this maximum value gives or parameterizes the time scale of the overall bounds. Okay. And these are geometric statements, so we can, it's a geometric exercise to, to, to verify this. So let us define the, this time scale as the time uh, which the observer, which is sitting at the initial radius of the star, measures between the moment in which the star starts collapsing and the moment in which it bounces back to its initial radius. Okay? So the observer is uh, sitting at this fixed radius and is going to measure this time. We can also consider the time interval for observers which are uh, at the at infinite radius. Okay? And there is uh, essentially a Ratchet factor, as in due to classical general relativity, which is not important for, for the arguments. So now we can calculate this quantity uh, geometrically using the geometries, and the expression, the final expression, takes this form. It has two pieces. This part here is essentially the classical collapsing time and bouncing time, which is proportional just, uh, to the mass of the collapsing mass. Uh, using the Oppenheimer Snyder model. So, but the important point is that this is a quantity that is determined by the classical collapsing time uh, of the star from the given initial radius and the moment of the bounce. And the other part of this equation is linear in this parameter measuring the size of the topological region. So that in principle, depending on the value which is taken by this parameter, we can have different values for the time scale. In principle, before doing any calculations or using any additional arguments, this quantity, this time scale, could be anything. I mean, it could take different values. For instance, one possibility is that this time scale is larger than the Hawking evaporation <coughs> scale, which is uh, goes like n to the third power. And in this case, of course, this decay will not take place because there is not enough time for the black hole for the black hole to transform into be transformed in the white hole because the black hole will evaporate before it. So all the options below this evaporation scale, there are two nat natural options. One of them is taking a time scale which is essentially the mass to the second power. And this would be important for instance for cosmology because this would imply I mean this if this would if this happens indeed in nature then in that case, uh, primordial black holes would be exploding today. So it's like you can take the mass expected for a primordial black hole, and then you can see that the time scale implies that this 
remote black holes will be exploded today. The point is that you can use additional arguments based on white hole instabilities to show that if this is the time scale of the transition, of the decay between the black hole and the white hole, then the overall process cannot be time reverse on the body. So it's like you have to forget about this possibility if you want to have a time reversal invariant decay. The other natural possibility below this uh, evaporation time is a linear time which is linear in the mass. And what I'm going to show is that this is the option that arises in the calculation uh, that we have. So in order to do this calculation, we can use this the geometric uh, form of these interpolating functions we were discussing before. And essentially, what we are going to do is define the transition amplitude as the functional, thank you, functional integral of the exponential of minus the Einstein trivial action on the interpolating geometries. Okay. So the evaluation of the, of the classical action is lengthy, uh, but it's, it's straightforward. It's essentially it's doing some integrals. But when you arrange the, the result in a nice way, you see that this functional integral is given by this quality here. Essentially, we have a constant factor with some dimensionful, dimensionful constants. We have a dimensionless constant, which depends on the particular shape of the interpolation the interpolation function we are considering. But essentially, it takes these values. And we have a one-dimensional functional integral. Okay? So this can be evaluated using uh, discretization and then taking back uh, the continuum limit. I'm not going to enter into the details, but this can be evaluated exactly. And then, after that, we can evaluate the probability amplitude. It's like the, no, the probability that this process takes place, integrating, as always, the square of this transition amplitude. Okay? So this leads to an exponential decay law. This equation, this equation here, which means that the probability for this probability defined this way goes uh, rapidly for increases from 0 to 1 exponentially in a given time scale, in a mean lifetime, which is given by this one, okay? which is 1, essentially 1 over the mass of the black hole, of the collapsing mass. So if we come back to the discussion about the time, the time scale measured by external observers, this means that we have two, two portions in this time scale. One of them, which is the size of the interpolating region, is going to be determined by this probability exponential decay to be given by 1 over the mass of the black hole. Which means that if we compare it with this term, which was linear in the mass, we will get overall a time scale which is proportional to the mass. So this is a very short time scale. For instance, if we consider a neutron star like configurations, uh, like neutron star collapsing initial configurations, then uh, this time is going to be less than milliseconds. So it's really short. So this means that uh, if this affects, this effect would affect uh, newly, uh, new black holes which are formed in the collapse of regular stars, and they will appear shortly after, after the collapse. And importantly, most importantly, as we have microscopic modifications of the geometry, we would expect modifications of the gravitational wave signature associated, associated with the colors. So these modifications will come from the parts of space-time, which are not included in the classical description, which is essentially this portion of the, of the diagram. In particular, uh, if we have an expanding inhomogeneous star, we will expect to have additional emissions of gravitational radiation. And moreover, we expect also that several bounces like this will take place. So the natural thing to expect is that the gravitational wave signature will have a periodic structure and will be dampened. It will, it, it will decrease in time. So, uh, a specific, uh, a specific prediction for the gravitational wave pattern will appear uh, in the future. So, I conclude here the talk. So, uh, the main ideas I think are worth keeping in mind is that one of them is that we still don't know a definite theory of quantum gravity, so there is still some room to, for surprises to appear. 
and to change some of the notions we have in the classical theory. And in particular, quantum effects in black holes could be larger than some classical structures. Indeed, uh, there are, uh, let's say, theoretical arguments that point that uh, the, the singularities in gravitational collapse can be cured by considering by, by a bound of the collapsing matter. And there is a convergence of different arguments showing that time scales associated with this bound uh, are naturally given by this, I mean, are naturally linear in the mass. So it's like I only consider these, let's say, path integral evaluation, but there are additional arguments using classical instabilities, semi classical instabilities, and also considering, for instance, the behavior of curvature invariants and the cumulative one effects. So all of them point to the, to the same time scale. Of course, there is still work to do in order to fully, fully understand the theoretical models. But the idea is that this phenomenon takes place, we should expect some dampened oscillations followed by some stabilization, perhaps in a black hole or a compact star, which is no horizon, so it's still twisted or not what would be the, the answer. But for me, the most important point is that this kind of effects would be, should be observable, which in principle uh, could offer an opportunity to connect quantum gravity and gravitational wave observations. Okay, thank you. Distinguish this phenomenon of a quantum bounce uh, with uh, from uh, a phenomenon that would be just baryonic physics, like it just bounce due to pressure or something like this. Uh, well, I mean, I guess that the gravitational wave signature would be different. Like if you look at it in fine detail, probably you would not have the same. It would be really different if it's if it's due to the the. Sh but well, it's if after forming the black hole is inside the Schwarzschild radius and then it gets out. But, so yeah, but the initial state is things that are collapsing, so it's not, well, or maybe I, I just didn't understand the beginning, no. but I, I thought that when you're having the, when you have this drawing of things doing that, it's, yeah. uh, the, the initial state is the collapsing yes. structure, things that are not a black hole yet. It's, yeah. it's a star for the moment, right? Yes, at right. the bottom. At some point, you get, uh, you cross the Schwarzschild radius. All right, okay. and then you get but then, so yeah, <coughs> or maybe the time scale would be different? Or something? Yeah, of course, the time scale you have to determine. Uh, perhaps you have different time scales, that could be one option. And also, you see that uh, because you have the formation of the black hole, you need to have modifications of the geometry which affect uh, this region here, which is outside the gravitational radius. So probably you will see differences. You will, this will give some particular, you know, like a burst of radiation that probably you will not have in the other case. I mean, okay. you will have something similar, but probably the form, the specific form of the, of the waveform will be different, I guess. Yeah. That could be, could be a possibility. Yeah. Uh, my, my question would be, would you need a quantum balance? I'm you know, thinking about the solutions that were found by Gonzalo Ohm mm -hmm. and Diego over here. The so-called geon solutions is mm -hmm. what they do is working about the components of the model. Yeah. And they have high corrections, right? They have uh, R squared, yeah. high curvatures, which is what you want in that region. Mm -hmm. And you also have the contraction of the region tensor. Mm -hmm. So when we found solutions, we have these kind of bounces. So uh, but it seems to be very similar to what you mm -hmm. what you explained. Yeah, uh, if uh, I'm not sure in that case, but I guess that the bounds takes you to another universe, to a uh, constantly disconnected. I mean, okay. Uh, yes, we have a whole plethora of uh, solutions, right? You have these luminous which give you solutions with with without horizons, with without strokes, with without remote. Mm -hmm. So I mean, they have a wide variety of, of solutions. So mm -hmm. I suppose one solution in a specific luminous space would give you these solutions as well, and and they will give you the effective geometry that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Which would be described by some modification of yeah. the right? Mm -hmm. Well, I have to, yeah, for me, the important, I mean, sorry, here the important point is that this bouncing solution has been more or less uh, well known, let's say, not well known, but it has been considered. Probably the, 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 the fact that the black hole could bounce to, 
to some other thing, but usually uh, these geometries let's say that the, these two regions, asymptotic regions, are not causally connected. So usually this classical, if I remember correctly, let's say that this asymptotic region is different than this one. So it's like this, the bounds takes you to one other unit. So in these solutions, these are connected, these are the same. So it's like you will see the bounds in this universe. So because in these other solutions, uh, if you see the black hole, essentially uh, you will not see the bounds. Bounce is more theoretical, let's say, I don't know, uh, these, these solutions are like this. Yeah, and they have entity solutions also. Like Bounce in, in the same as in the same way. Yeah, my my thought is that if I have also other room spaces which are your solutions. Okay. The bounce, so. Is your solution, is, is your final solution the right one? <coughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So it's different today. Okay. No, that would like to be able to read that. Thank you.